Welcome everyone. I think I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for joining our panel today on community-based care. We have an excellent group of panelists with us today. Uh, Lenny Soar from CIF. Um, sorry, let me get my notes here. Uh, Winda Winawatan, um, who's Executive Director of Compassion First, and Han Toti, who um, is with Hagar International in Vietnam. Um, my name is Tanya DeCarmo, and I'm the facilitator here today. I'm currently a fellow in legal studies at University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, I study human trafficking and immigrant detention, um, including uh, community-based models of care for trafficked persons. And um, prior to um, prior to getting into academia, I worked for Chabdai for about um, eight years, both in Cambodia and the US. So um, to get started, um, what we'll, oh, so for an overview of today's session, just to give you an idea of what we're doing and where we're going. Um, before each speaker shares, I'm gonna introduce them and each speaker will speak for about five minutes about the work they're doing. Um, after everyone has spoken, I'll summarize some of the trends and ask a few questions of the panelists, and then we'll open for Q&A from the audience. Um, so to start out, we're going to start with Lenny Soar from Children and Families. Um, Children and Families is a local NGO in Cambodia founded in 2006. Um, asking the question, can family-based care be effectively utilized as, as an alternative to institutional care in Cambodia? Uh, to date, CIF is one of the leading pioneers of community-based care, um, placing vulnerable and orphan children in safe and loving families. Um, and they work closely with the government and geo partners, churches and donors um, to prevent family separation, trafficking and exploitation. Um, so I will go ahead and hand it off to Winnie to start us off. Thank you. Let me share with you. And everyone see the screen, sorry. So thanks everyone. Again, uh, my name is uh, Lini. I'm the executive director of uh, Children and Families. So it's a local organization that Tanya has mentioned. We've been operating in Cambodia since uh, 2006. Uh, with the initial questions at that time, whether family-based care or community-based care can be an alternative to uh, institutional care. Actually, that, that was really challenging, especially for our co-founders, uh, key individuals who were there at that time, when uh, residential care was like a popular topic and trend for people. But uh, you would see here, you would see here that after uh, 15 years of uh, providing services that we have a range of services uh, that uh, you can see in the pictures as well, ranging from emergency care, family preservation, able care and foster to adopt. So when, when a, a child is referred uh, to CIF from the Ministry of Social Affairs, Department of Social Affairs, churches, community people, the local authorities too. So our team would uh, jointly conduct uh, the assessment to make sure that whether emergency care up to 90 days is um, necessary for them. And in the emergency care, we provide health care treatments. And one, one uh, of the most important things is to do the family tracing because we wanna make sure that uh, we don't take the children out from the family unnecessary, you know, or support them for a long time, but we want to reunite them back into families. So there's a lot of negotiation if we can track the families, if we can uh, find their relatives and uh, negotiation or whether a temporary support uh, can keep them together. So if, uh, if um, successful, then uh, we may reunite back, them back into families or if the family is safe enough. And uh, another, another uh, service that we have is the family uh, preservation. So it's more of a prevention activities. 
uh, if we hear that um, a child is being at risk of family separations or maybe family members want to put them into orphanage, that's where our team would go and intervene or um, negotiate with families and work with the local authorities to make sure that uh, with our temporary support, they can stay within their own families. And I think that up to now, one of the key service that we have, and I think it, it's unique too, is our ABLE care. We call it ABLE care. Uh, and that is the service that we provide across our programs uh, for children with disabilities. So we have like a specialized team, both um, in our head office and at the, the communities as well, to make sure that families can be trained properly on how to care for children uh, within the family setting. If, if for any reason we try hard enough and the family cannot be traced or found or unsafe for, for the child to be placed into, then domestic adoption is the second option. Uh, that's where we recruit select families, uh, we train them ahead of time around child rights, child participation, positive parenting, et cetera, to make sure that families are ready to take in the child and to safeguard them at all costs. So if sometimes, after sometimes, we've seen the strong bonds within uh, foster families and the child themselves, and if they are interested in adopting the child, then we can uh, facilitate the domestic adoption. And even up to now, we have successfully uh, facilitated 29 uh, cases. Um, so, so after 15 years and having served more than 800 uh, children in over 300 families, our question, our answers to the initial questions that we have since the start is that it's the resounding yes. Cambodian families can provide loving homes for vulnerable children as an alternative to institutional care. So thank you. And I think we can uh, discuss this further. That's all from me. Let me... Thank you so much, Lenny. Um, next, we have uh, Winda Unawatan, who is Executive Director of Compassion First. Compassion First uh, provides long-term hope-filled solutions for survivors of sex trafficking and exploitation through shelter-based aftercare and community-based care. So um, welcome, Winda. Thank you, Tania. Hi, everyone. I'm Winda, as Tania introduced, that I'm uh, the executive director of Yayasan Kasih Yang Utama, part of Compassion First in Indonesia. Compassion First started work in Indonesia in 2010. Our mission is to provide long-term, hopeful solution for survivors of sex trafficking and exploitation. Next slide, please. And next. And these are the work that we are focused on. First is our wraparound aftercare and community-based care with victim-centered approach, trauma counseling, education support. They include lots of catching up education, vocational and life skills training, regular activities, spiritual care, medical care, and also family and community support for success reintegration. Second is legal advocacy and human rights protection and also case managed intervention support. We seek funds and provide supplemental funding for rescue and work with both police and families toward the safe and successful recovery of the children. Third is the Law Enforcement Partnership. It's a collaborative training conferences and ongoing professional relationship with the law enforcement. We also do prevention. We collaborate with the local government and either, either NGO or CSO in raising awareness through seminars, campaign, workshop to the local communities, including to the head of community, religion leaders, and the students. This year, we expand our prevention work doing transit monitor, collaborate with Love Justice International. Transit monitor is a tangible human trafficking prevention strategy where monitors stand in key transit location, look for signs of trafficking, and and use a questioning protocol to find active human trafficking cases in order to intercept potential victims. In 2014, we start the community development in Ishafa. It's also part of our community-based care program. 
and it's also become one of our prevention strategy in a uh, vulnerable population of the cemetery, cemetery brothels in West Java. We serve a precious group of women and their children through education sponsorship, entrepreneurial training and support, and provide drop-in centers for tutoring, training, and community gatherings. Next, I see how CF aftercare is a strength-based wrap-around system of care. Strength-based means our focus is on the survivor strengths, emphasizing building resilience. Wrap-around care where the design place the survivor at the center of her program with the assistance of her case coordinator, allowing her to have significant control of her future. In 2010, we opened our first shelter in North Sulawesi and 2017 in East Java, and are currently preparing to open one more shelter in West Java. In 2020, just before COVID, we opened a transition home in North Sulawesi. Our transition home function as a transitional housing program through independent, non-restrictive, home-like living arrangement for the survivors while we are continue to partner with her and family for reintegration. We start to evaluate our program since last year. Next slide, please. And the result is we need to change on how we do our aftercare, including developing our community-based care program. Uh, there is two main factors that cause us to change. First is the phase structure of the CF aftercare program often held back the progress of the girls of or the survivors. By offer emphasizing achievement of behavior goals, we found that many girls were in residential care longer than desired. It was, it was also hard for them to consistently behave at the level we asked them to. The second is we also become aware of research that show the value of working with families and communities and not just the survivors. Building the resilience of families and communities provide more opportunities to build resilience in the individuals. Uh, also in the past, our work with the families and communities was limited. So what changes we do? CF core principles remain the same, but we are changing on the way we do the aftercare program, eliminate the phase structure, and developing the individual care plan that is unique for each. Next slide, please. One more. Thank you. We are going to be adding more programs to increase the strength and resilience of families and of the community for better reintegration, increasing family and community work. Our care will include residential care and continue after reintegration as community-based care. This new program also will bring advantage for the survivor to spend less time in the residential facility and spend more time outside the facility to build her own safe community and expanding her own supportive network Works while getting more independence and self-sufficiency. We are just recently started to implement our new program at the Transition Home in North Sulawesi and later we'll be implementing our shelter and the community development work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Winda. Um, next, we have Han from Hagar International in Vietnam. She's the trauma-informed care advisor uh, there in Vietnam. So welcome, Han. You're muted. Yes, thank you. Hello, everyone. So my name is Han from Hagar International in Vietnam. I would like to share my screen now. Can you can you see the my song? So um, uh, Haya uh, International uh, was established uh, since uh, nineteen ninety four in Cambodia uh, and uh, start working in Vietnam in uh, two thousand and nine. In present. Haya International has been providing support to survival of slavery, human trafficking, and abuse in four uh, countries, uh, Afghanistan, Cambodia, Vietnam, and Singapore. Haya Vietnam uh, provides two main programs of supporting survival of abuse uh, and capacity building for local authorities to foster quality 
um, of services uh, in supporting survivor. Uh, one of the main uh, approach that Haya pursue is trauma-informed care. We are aware of long-term and diverse uh, consequence of trauma on survival, family, and community. Uh, we seek to prevent trauma and re-traumatization in every level of communication and support to survival and community. Uh, and we believe that when healing happens, the cycle of trauma stops. Uh, so the whole journey is a foundation program uh, that Haiga um, run seen um, is uh, establishing. Uh, it is uh, individual, long-term and holistic support uh, directly to survivor of uh, human trafficking and other type of abuse. Uh, so um, this is um, statistic uh, in 2000 and uh, uh, 2021, um, we uh, support uh, the main um, survival are uh, from domestic violence uh, the, and other uh, group are uh, sexual abuse and human trafficking. So the whole journey uh, is foundation, uh, foundation program, um, and uh, there are four main, uh, four, four domain in the whole journey program. Uh, there are protect, heal, uh, try, and lead. In protection, we provide safe accommod accommodation. Uh, the safe accommodation can be uh, their family, their, their home, uh, or other place that we can support them to rent. Uh, it can be in their uh, in the hometown, or can be uh, in other place, or uh, near the um, Haiga office in uh, uh, Hanoi capital. Uh, with survivor of human trafficking, many of them have a high need of uh, doing uh, identity card uh, after reintegration into their hometown. So um, in the first step, uh, we often provide legal support um, in their hometown. Uh, the second domain uh, uh, is HEAL. Uh, so in this one, we provide a health check, uh, medical support, uh, and um, other kind of counseling, uh, like crisis counseling, psychosocial counseling, uh, or trauma therapy. Uh, the, the third one, uh, try. Uh, in this one, we uh, support them to continue education uh, or uh, vocational training um, uh, or job placement. Uh, uh, we also working with their family um, to um, support community uh, integration. And in the last domain, we support them to build capacity um, to be uh, a leader uh, of the of their community. Um, we organize uh, peer group activity uh, so that they, um, uh, in the peer group activity, uh, they, uh, will, they are trained um, many life skills or leadership skills. Uh, and we also provide them the opportunity to attend different um, conference workshops, national or international uh, uh, so that they have a chance to raise as the voice of uh, their group. And the second um, program that we run is partnering with local authority to post the quality of support to survival. Uh, uh, in present, we partner with um, uh, two main uh, provinces in Vietnam, uh, and uh, we we also partnering with uh, some other local uh, NGO so that we can um, support them in um, capacity building in working with the survival. Uh, 
Uh, so um, in uh, capacity building for uh, local authority uh, in province, we uh, there are uh, some main uh, topic uh, are uh, gender-based violence, uh, human trafficking, um, legal support, uh, trauma-informed care, uh, case management and counseling. Mm. We also support uh, province uh, so that they have uh, a finance um, capacity uh, to support survival uh, because many of them uh, have a difficulty uh, when they uh, come back home hometown uh, so they can uh, start uh, their new business uh, or um, having loan. Uh, we also support uh, province local authority to uh, improve uh, their uh, awareness uh, raising uh, campaign um, so that um, they uh, they can run the uh, campaign uh, on uh, human trafficking or domestic violence uh, and um, the quality of the campaign uh, is increased. Uh, so uh, Heiga used to have a shelter in many years but we start moving into community community based care since um, 2018 uh, and um, we find that uh, there are uh, many uh, benefits um, and uh, for for the uh, survival when they uh, live in uh, their community um, it is uh, they they find that it is a family uh, safe uh, place for them. Many of them don't want to leave their hometown to move another place like a, a shelter. So it is a uh, more uh, familiar for them to live in their hometown and uh, um, give uh, the community connection and acceptance. So um, this is a chance for them to uh, quicker connect to to their community, their school uh, or cultural activity in their community. Uh, and uh, it helped them quicker to achieve uh, resilience. Uh, and uh, the activities that we um, support local authority partner, it will it puts the quality of services so that uh, they can provide uh, support to survival better. And this is a uh, uh, this is. I mean, uh, how to say, uh, this is better when they got a uh, leave. Uh, they still have uh, the skill, knowledge skill uh, to support the survival. Uh, and um, the, this will increase involvement and quick response of local authority because um, when we work with the local authority, uh, many uh, of them are not aware of human trafficking issue. So um, they might not care about the survival or uh, might not actually uh, support the survival. So from the, uh, Higa, uh, the activity, Higa support, they, they uh, expect more responsibility in supporting uh, the citizen, uh, the, the people in their community. Uh, however, we also find some challenging. Uh, it is uh, we uh, have to spend uh, much more time uh, to travel to community uh, than uh, because each, uh, each uh, survivor live in different community. Um, and um, lack of a professional working space with uh, the survival um, because we have to um, find uh, the play in their um, home or uh, in a um, local authority office, but it is not very professional working space. Uh, or we, and um, uh, the survive, it is lack of career opportunity for survival uh, when uh, they live in their community. Um, and uh, providing uh, trauma therapy or counseling, it is also difficult because uh, uh, we, we cannot travel to their place um, uh, regularly every week. Uh, yeah, that's it for uh, my presentation. Thank you very much for your listening. Thank you, Han. And thanks to all of you for your presentations. Um, so next, 
I had just a few uh, questions to ask to the panel. Um, the questions that I ask, um, you, not everyone has to answer them. You can just answer them if you want to. Um, I really appreciated um, the insights into um, all the work everyone is doing to move towards community-based care or are already providing community-based care. Um, I was thinking about what Han had just said about the benefits of community-based care. Um, a study that myself and two others recently published about uh, using the longitudinal data for trafficking survivors in Cambodia showed that those who were reintegrated who didn't have um, close social connections in the community after they were reintegrated were much more likely to face re-exploitation or trafficking. And so um, I really want for the panel today to really be highlighting the benefits of community-based care and some of the promising practices, as well as um, some of the challenges that um, you and your organizations are facing. So for the first question, I thought we would start um, by maybe talking about any of the challenges you faced in the work you're doing um, with trafficking victims or survivors um, or exploitation survivors um, in general, some of the um, challenges you're facing. And if you have any um, stories or uh, stories about uh, maybe how you've overcome some of those challenges, that would be great too. If you don't have those, that's okay. Um, but uh, maybe if you wanna throw those in, if you have some ideas of how you've been overcoming those. So I'll leave it open to whoever wants to begin. And again, you don't have to answer. It's just open for whoever wants to answer. Can I, Tania? Okay, the challenges. So uh, as I said, that we actually just going to start doing more community-based care, but we do have like some community-based care work also before. And then these are like some of the challenges that we found so far that, you know, Indonesia is um, like ge 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 geographically, like we spread out, like we have lots of island, right? So sometimes like, I think a couple of years ago, we have a, a survivor refer to us and she live from Jakarta and then also run from one from West Java. And then so with that kind of situation, they have their family they are located quite far from the residential, the shelter. So the, you know, a community assessment and then the family assessment take a lot of work, actually. And then even the survivor have limited time, actually, to meet with their family because of the distance and the cost to actually go visit their family with the the survivor they just live around the shelter they can go home like pretty often right but this survivor that come from far away is kind of like hard actually so that's become maybe will become one of the challenges when we put more work in the community-based care as i think han also mentioned about that and then the family that you know some of the girls that we uh, serve the family is the one actually that traffic them it's unfortunately i mean under uh some of the really hard situation the family actually end up traffic them so that's going to be challenge so working with the family and then also sometimes the trafficker come from their community as well you know if they live around the community that the trafficker family maybe the trafficker in the prison but the community i mean the family is living there it's hard actually to working with that kind of situation. So we need to find like, you know, other safe family for these girls to be reintegr reintegrate back to the family. So I think these two may be main challenges that we have so far and we will have more later, but it shouldn't stop us from doing this work because the benefit actually is a lot. Yes, go ahead, Han. Yeah, thank you, Tanya. Uh, so uh, one of the challenge that we face uh, when uh, supporting uh, the survivor, uh, they uh, because uh, many of them living in a uh, uh, ethnic minority group, uh, their uh, Viet language uh, or King language, the main language in Vietnam, uh, is very difficult, uh, challenging for them. And also their knowledge of identity or legal issue is very low. 
So um, it is very challenging for them to get a very normal thing like identity card. Uh, firstly, they are not very care about that. And secondly, uh, they are uh, so so they do don't do anything. But it will, it will affect them a lot if they don't have an identity card when they come back home town. So um, uh, we uh, connect them to the local authority. Uh, and in some uh, area, the local authority are, are not well support, uh, did not well support um, to the survivor because they they are they just they they are not aware of the human trafficking issue. Um, so uh, they um, they might um, think other issue around them like a criminal issue or some other uh, social uh, issue, and it make them. Uh, not uh, support well to the survival. So we had to work with both of the survivor and the local authority. So, um, and uh, when when we, um, when the client, when the su survivor are uh, better aware and commit to the process um, of getting the identity cards, then we find challenging of how to uh, push the local authority to take responsibility, even though that is a very uh, minor and uh, normal step. But if they don't have re responsibility in supporting uh, their people, they will not do anything. But So uh, we have to um, advocate um, from a different layer, layer level and also uh, talk to them about the legal uh, principle uh, if they don't follow the legal principle, it is their responsibility uh, with the legal issue. So uh, I think uh, even though it is a, a small um, issue in many other uh, area, but uh, to some other uh, province in Vietnam, it is challenging. So um, uh, yeah, we uh, have to push them, work with them, uh, and work with both the client and, and so a client, a survivor, and local authority as well. Uh, and the other uh, challenging that we also find uh, in uh, is that uh, the um, uh, many of them having um, um, trauma and mental health issue. So um, it is very challenging to provide um, on the phone or uh, or uh, on um, internet. Um, because uh, they they don't have a smartphone, they only have a very <laughs> yeah. Um, so so it's very challenging, and uh, so one one of the but we still have to keep uh, phoning them so that we can provide the uh, minimum uh, support uh, on psychological uh, issue, uh, and the other uh, solution is uh, we organize uh, the. Uh, some uh, training uh, like life skill training or retreat, uh, one to cho choose per year, so that we uh, we invite them into uh, Hanoi, uh, where Haiga uh, Haiga are located, um, and we um, run the activity uh, around uh, two to five days. Uh, it depends on each year, uh, and uh, each chance for them uh, to. Uh, experience uh, the peer support uh, group uh, and uh, life skill or counseling activity. Uh, so yeah, that is our solution uh, in this case. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I'd like to share a little bit as well, um, based on the experience that we have uh, working uh, to support children and reintegrating them back into the communities because we know that uh, they have experienced uh, some sort of trauma in their life. So trauma-informed care um, is uh, something that uh, we, we train the families, the caseworkers that are working directly with the children as well. So to make sure that all involved uh, stakeholders understand that uh, it takes time. It takes time for people and don't expect only the best. And uh, another thing is the care plan development. 
that's when you are trying to not hold the burden to like the organization has to provide solution in everything. So um, we also encourage uh, the local authorities, the family themselves, the local communities to support um, the children that uh, we are supporting in the community. What can be done um, as a whole package in order to, because uh, you remember the quote, like it takes a village. It is not CIF alone. It is not the local authorities alone. So it takes everyone in the community to welcome uh, the children um, into the family uh, in the community themselves. So this is something that uh, we found uh, useful by uh, introducing this trauma-informed care, by uh, uh, establishing or developing the care plan together um, so that uh, it can foster ownership uh, within the children themselves, the families, as well as the uh, community. Yeah, this is something that we found useful so far. Tania, can I add one more uh, for the challenge? So there's one like huge challenge as well that we find uh, doing the community-based care is the, you know, the community understanding about what is actually trafficking, especially when the survivors come from the sexual exploitation. Sometimes, I, uh, maybe it's similar to all the Southeast Asian country, but also in Indonesia, it's kind of like uh, bad things happen when they're actually sexually exploited. So sometimes the surrounded community like thinking negatively about the survivor and her family actually. So it takes a lot of work to like give awareness and then to give understanding to the community if uh, you know they're not really um, like a step actually the situation happen in their neighborhood so that's one of the another challenge as well yes thank you um some of you have already touched on this a little bit but i'll open it up again um if anyone wanted to share um some of the uh promising practices or best practices um, that you've been using in your programs or plan to use in your programs um, in providing community-based care um, for survivors and uh, others. Um, yeah, I'll leave it just open for promising practices or things that you've um, learned along the way that you've found has worked well. Uh, yes, I would like to share. Uh, and I, I think I used to mention, but I, I want to emphasize again, that is um, a capacity building for local authority. Uh, we think that it is very important because uh, local authority is, um, is uh, in that community and um, they can provide different kind of uh, support. Uh, that they are not aware of. that is uh, that can be their responsibility, but they might not aware of that. Uh, for example, it, it, it is a system in Vietnam. So, for example, when they come back, uh, they they can um, the get support from uh, women union uh, and um, uh, another department of social affair, um, and also uh, the. Uh, Common, a uh, common level, um, com common level of um, police, uh, and um, there there are different. There's some kind of support like uh, finance support, um, uh, job and job placement, and and some other kind of support that they they need um, implement to support um, to client to the survivor. So uh, when they are uh, aware that they uh, they will be more responsible civil for the people in their community. So uh, we find that um, a capacity building uh, by training and coaching, uh, regular coaching like um, monthly coaching in a uh, quite a long time, like uh, around six, six months to one year or better than more than one year. So um, uh, they can um, follow the legal um, principle. Uh, in supporting the survival and also provide uh, trauma informed quality support to the survival. Other, other, if if not, they might um, uh, provide a support which is very 
um, which might be re-traumatized to the survivor and very power over to the survivor. So uh, we find that um, supporting local authority is very important. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'd like to share a little bit about our work for the community-based care in West Java in the cemetery area. As I said before, that we like doing our prevention work in there, also community development. So we open uh, two centers in the area that the work that we try to prevent trafficking, but also develop the community. And one of the things that we do successfully is how to involve the family more. So um, we can like provide scholarship for the children, but it also come in agreement with the family that family need, need to contribute as well, including attending some of the courses like uh, healthy relationship, healthy communication, conflict resolution, and so on. So that kind of things and involving the family more into that kind of work, I think is uh, playing a huge part of the successful community-based care, uh, even though it's kind of like challenging because some of the family you know, have their own culture. So how to like, you know, approach the family in the way that its family can be different, right? <laughs> the challenges can be different as well, but how to be creative actually to approach the family on like this kind of partnership to support their, their children as well. Um, I, I like to share a little bit, um, actually, um, before we've been, CIF has been so much, um, about all about us, like internally about the cases that we have about trying our best to respond to it. But, um, in the last five years, we've seen that, um, if we think that there's a lack of services, like I can say like us like providing a comprehensive uh, services like that, what can be done? So we started sharing our best practices to whoever is interested in big meetings, in networks, in groups like that. And we train, right now we are training the local authorities as well as the local NGOs who are interested, especially services for children with disabilities. And uh, with COVID coming in, with the challenges, we, so far we, we took in cases with, with the mind, with the goal that we are able to respond to it. And we've never asked the local authorities to contribute, what can they do before we take in the cases? And we found out that actually, if we had asked that maybe 10 years ago, they would be able to <laughs> collaborate more with us. They would have more ownership so right now we say that, okay, that, that's the best practices that uh, we want to continue doing that. Before taking any cases, we need to conduct uh, the meetings again and again and ask what can the local authorities do for this case before we, we support, like co-support. And, and uh, the last one is uh, empowering our caseworkers. I think before it's more like, okay, um, they know the cases, but yes, everything is from like managers. We need to, um, how do I say, reverse the power, even in decision makings. Like uh, we collect information from the caseworkers, whether it is time, whether the progress, whether it is time to close the case, it is time to refer services like that. So this is, uh, these are the key uh, practices that we want to keep on doing um, even in the next years or so. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm learning a lot myself and just learning about um, some of the things you guys have been doing on the field and learning. So that's excellent. Um, we do have a question from the audience, and I think we'll transition to that. Um, someone asked about um, if you have advice or suggestions um, when working with a survivor in a community where the um, <clears throat> offender is also in the community. Um, yeah, so we'll leave it at that. Um, this, uh, you know, they said something about um, in a lot of communities where they work, um, 
a lot of times things are just paid off, but how do you um, really provide community-based care for someone in a community where the offender is also living or comes to? Uh, yes, uh, I can share uh, the experience from uh, Vietnam. Uh, we used to have uh, one uh, case uh, with the offender, uh, like you mentioned, uh, are very um, powerful in uh, their village. Um, uh, yeah, actually, it is a very challenging case, uh, not easy <laughs> like the other one. Uh, so um, we have to work in different layers. Um, we support uh, them uh, a lot uh, so that they uh, have a better understanding of their right and, and the law issue. And then uh, support them to uh, work with the police um, uh, so that the police um, also take more responsibility um, in supporting the survival. Um, and um, in case, uh, uh, in this case, it, it takes a, a long, a long time uh, to um, for for the uh, police to take the action. Yeah, it is not easy. Uh, so it, it takes a long time. Uh, but we have to, uh, how to say, a patient to that process. And we, we patient, and, we, and then we had to be patient in supporting the survival. Um, and uh, during the time, the, uh, so the, 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 we, we push uh, the police to support safety issue for the survival. Um, uh, so I think um, they all already took some action to support safety issue for the survival. Uh, however, uh, the, the survivors still have a, a, a lot of fear. Um, so we have to work with them on um, identify if the fear is actual or perceived fear. Uh, or psychological issue, um, and we uh, and there was time we took them to other place like um, Haga office uh, in a, in the capital, so that um, they had uh, she has time uh, to uh, um, to like to take rest and also to work on psychological issue, and after that can she come back to the community um, and. Um, and do a safety plan for herself later on. Uh, yeah. So this is um, that. So I, I I would like to summarize that we have to work on two layer, um, working with the police um, and supporting a law to work with that issue, uh, and then uh, support a client, support survival on their um, safety issue uh, and other and other needs. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Um, if no one else wants to answer that one, we do have another. Um, Lenny did put a uh, comment in the chat uh, responding to that question, if you wanted to look at that as well. Um, someone asked in the chat as well um, to the panelists how you do family and community assessments to ensure, so I'm gonna turn my fan off, I don't know if it's distracting the sound, um, to ensure that uh, they're safe for children. Um, like who do you interview? How do you do the assessments? I'll respond to that questions. So doing regarding the time doing family and community assessment can be a long process, actually depend on the family and communities. Like example, if the community is quite huge, like we have maybe like one of the survivor, she has like, you know, eight siblings living in one home with their parents. And then also depend on the community surround and what their, you know, level of understanding about trafficking, because sometimes it took um, more than just one meeting actually to be with them in explaining about what is human trafficking. And then yes, definitely meeting with the neighborhood. And then also it's not just the family in, in itself, the Kinsey family, but also the extent, extension of the family 
who's who's around in order to find a safe family we need to you know not just interview or i mean assess the main family but also extension family in case the main family is really like not safe for the girl or the the children to be reintegrated back and then i speak about children because our main work for children so maybe for adult is different and then also definitely the head of community because the 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 involvement of the head of community to bring awareness to the whole community is so important if the head of community understand this issue then the rest of community will actually follow the leader so it depends it can take like a couple of weeks to a couple of years depends on the family and community situation are there any um are there any other thoughts about um, assessing community. Um, if not, we also have a question about um, how COVID has impacted your community work um, or how maybe you anticipate it will continue to affect it in the future. Um, so yeah, I'll leave that open. Uh, yes, I, I can share about the COVID um, issue. Uh, yes, we did uh, face with um, many challenges uh, during COVID time because we cannot travel to any other province in 2000 and 2001. Um, so every, almost every IT activity is um, <laughs> delayed. Um, and um, so... Uh, as uh, some activity we can have with uh, support with them is about uh, uh, providing uh, safety information, um, psycho psychosocial support or crisis counseling uh, on the phone, uh, or uh, basic needs support like um, yeah basic need like um, the supplier or uh, food uh, etc. Um, and um, uh, so, and uh, we also uh, work with um, local authorities so that they can support us to provide uh, the basic need support. Because uh, as I mentioned, we cannot travel to other provinces. Uh, but luckily, since yeah, 2022, uh, uh, we can uh, travel everywhere. So it is much easier now. Uh, uh, there is one activity that we... Uh, um, we run uh, for uh, is that we do a, a self care or men mental health care activity uh, on webinar um, and um, hundred people attend the activity and um, it is really helpful uh, during that time because it is very stress uh, for them during COVID time so that activity can yeah it's great that we the internet and uh, webinar is um, uh, accessible for them at that time um, so we can grant activity yes that's it thank you for the question if there are no other thoughts on covid um can still leave that open there was a question specifically for winda about what activities you do for community development. Thank you. I'll maybe answer a little or give uh, feedback a little bit about COVID. This, two, this past two years has been so challenging, especially for the residential and in the community, family and community work, because, uh, you know, we need to do like our own lockdown you know, like semi lockdown actually, which we can like limit it the family meeting actually, and then a family visit of the survivor to their family and community. Because if like one girl, we have actually situation that because of the the need for the girls or the survivor to actually uh, do the test at the school, and then when she come back, she actually encounter. Uh, I mean, got got. Uh, you know, got COVID. So <laughs> it's like easy to spread out uh, during the shelter. So that's one of the challenging. And to answer Santi, hi Santi, I think I've met you a while ago. So our community development work in West Java, uh, we do like support the woman there and then the, the woman and her family. And most of the women come from the 
what we call like cemetery sex worker actually during the day they're like you know cleaning the graveyard and then at the night it's turned out become like cemetery brothels where they like serve a customer just for like one or two bucks just to feed their family so we provide to centers in the heart of that community that like not too far from the cemetery area and then uh, provide what we call entrepreneurship support for them. So we do open uh, what's called yellow flower collection, which is we train the women, those women that want to, you know, uh, learn new, learn new skill or different skill. We train them and then also provide micro business to them. And then the teenager also like they make a uh, handicraft uh, from batik, like the specific fabric from from Indonesia. Make like tote bag or skirt or diary diary or journal. And then the income is fully go back to them. We just like cut the like for the next um like. Uh, what like the capital like for the next fabric and then the expenses and then the the rest of the fund come back to them and then also we provide scholarship for their children so the woman you know can learn a new skill and then the children can go to school and as I said before when the when the children go to school uh, we sponsor them and the family need to agree in some of the you know partnership that attend classes uh courses for the family especially for the moms and how to like work together in the you know a uh, better way to support their family as well so that's uh, some of the things that we do in West Java for the community development thank you thank you so we have only a few minutes left I thought that um, to close um, were there any was there anyone on the panel that had any closing thoughts or anything to share, I'm sort of putting you on the spot, but um, any closing thoughts? I'll start, Tania. Um, uh, Community-based care is challenging because uh, working at the residential, you know, we have our own standard and we can like control what we want to have at the residential, right? which is working in the community, there's a lot of things that we cannot control. You know, the feedback, the response of the community and then family is can be challenging. But I will encourage all of like the participants in here to do that because we've seen like why we took this direction because uh, like the survivor that we serve in our shelter, you know, they've been surrounding by the safe family in the shelter, right? Like all of the staff care for them, passionate about this work, love them. And then we have our SOP, like we cannot do a lot of things that actually put a harm on them. But when they're back to the community, there's a lot of things they cannot control. So we need to teach them train them, coach them how to be safe in the community and then working with their family. Because even though like, let's say maybe their family is the one that traffic them, that's the worst scenario, but it's still their family, right? So we need to find a way to encourage the family and then the community to help the survivor to be able to be independent and then, you know, um, have a lot of things to do in the community. That's for me, thank you. Uh, yes, I'd like to say one thing. Uh, I agree with uh, Peter on um, there are many challenges uh, in community-based care. Uh, however, um, working on, on this approach, uh, giving us uh, another another chance uh, and and the way to work to uh, uh, work with the whole family and the community as well. Um, so that uh, through the raising awareness uh, event, so that uh, the community family and the community uh, are better understanding about the issue. Mm, and uh, I think that is another um, uh, benefit uh, for, for the community as well. So uh, I think that is a good, good point. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I... I, I would like to call for more support on uh, providing community-based care. Um, it's possible, it's effective, um, especially for the children uh, themselves. Sorry, we work mainly with children. Uh, for the children themselves, they belong to the community. So it may take time to reintegrate 
um, to, to have a, a different style from the residential care, but it's possible. So once you invest in that, you know that it's a long-term development uh, for, for their future, for their future well-being. So um, let, let's, let's uh, come together and uh, create more community-based care uh, practices and services for, for them. Thank you. Great, thank you. What a um, wonderful collection of final words. Um, thank you to everyone who attended our session today. I hope you leave with some new information or inspiration and um, I wish you the best um, as you continue to attend this great conference. So thank you so much. And I will be closing the webinar. Thank you, uh, panelists as well. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.